right, and say this is the price if you want to get them. Okay. okay? And um, you can have a look around. And some people in the past have gone on the internet and they've found that they're cheaper if they order them from overseas, and, and that's all good. But the problem with ordering them from overseas is you can only order one. If you start to order more than one, you actually the customs get onto it and, and you charge tax on the whole group. So um, it's actually better to buy them as a bulk with a discount uh, locally. So however you want to purchase them, I, I don't mind. But um, what I'm suggesting today is, write your name here, I'm offering two books. One is the book that we can get straight away. Now, some people at the moment are getting these for $25. Uh, I know in Woodner at the post office they managed to get one for $25 and someone picked up one the other day in Adelaide at, uh, on sale in Marion for $25. Now, normally they're $45. So it's a nice addition. Yeah. Um, so if you're interested in me investigating how much they are, right, put a tick there. Secondly, there's a new book coming out in May, as I told you, and if you're interested in getting that one, that's a CSIRO publication, uh, put a tick here as well, times one, times two, whatever. How much are they going to be? Oh, so they're two different books? Yes. Oh, right, I thought they were different way to that. No, no, so it's a totally new book. Yep. So um, you've had Pizzies before and you, you've had um, two or three others, Simpson and Day, and I can't remember all the others, yep. but this one's a totally new book with four new authors. So, Are you recommending it? I think it'll be pretty good knowing the authors and knowing what they're aiming to do. But I haven't seen it yet. So, um, what it'll have is it'll have more pictures of the different molts of birds. So it'll have juvenile molts and and so it'll it it should be more detailed. But I haven't seen it. So if if you go on the internet, you can actually get a bit of a um, preview of it and, and what's there looks good. They show the birds nicely. There's arrows pointing to the parts you need to know um, and that that looks very useful but I can't promise anything. I just know that Danny Rogers who's the second author, I've done a lot of work with him and he's brilliant and really does know his stuff. So, so that's the first two columns. Tick one, tick both, tick none. Then the second two, there's two types of binoculars. There's the fives, the Nikon Monarch fives, which are about three or four hundred dollars in the past, depending on the Australian dollar at the time. And then there's the sevens, which are about six, seven hundred dollars in the past. So if you're interested in getting a quote on either of those, it's not a commitment to buying them. Um, I'll, I'll just find out how many people are interested in them and then we'll see what we can get as far as the discount goes. And then what will happen in the future is when we've got an indication of the price, you can contact me and for the bird books, I'll just order them and you can pay me the money and I'll give them to you on the day. With the binos, what I've done in the past is I've given everyone my bank account and got you to pay the money into the bank account when I've ordered them and then I just pay and you know, it might be six, seven, eight thousand dollars or something like that for, for all the binos that we buy. And then So the Wooden group are doing a similar thing, so they'll be involved in quite a Yes, so the Woodner people of the ones who were there this week okay. have indicated who's interested. Um, and like there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six pairs of binoculars that they'd probably be purchasing. <coughs> so if we get eight or ten here, that, that's a fair bit of purchasing power. Um, last year, I reckon I ended up ordering about 25 or 30 and we cornered the Australian market. They couldn't get it. That was pretty much the um, Australian market. So as this comes around, if you're interested, just put your name down, put a tick, times one, times two, whatever is relevant, and pass it on. Is it worth having one of each with the bono? Like, do, do, do they do something like... No, the, the only difference is you get better quality light through the sevens. Yeah. And... Um, it's just price, really. Yeah. So, it, it, the, the, the three $400 ones, the fives, 
they're good. They're like the the middle of the middle of the ranges. So they're not the cheap ones. They're, they're gas filled and they're waterproof. They're all good. The uh, sevens are about seven eight hundred dollars, and that's the top of the middle. Which ones are these? Again? They're the fives. That's fine. Yep. And then you step up to ridiculous amounts. You know, if you want to spend two, three, four, five thousand dollars, you can do that. But <laughs> that, that's serious <laughs> binos. That's busy in the Yeah. Can they stand a bit of a bit of song in there? Yeah, they can. Um, and I've had no real problems. The one problem I've had with these, but I've been able to get it repaired, is that sometimes this eyepiece ratchet doesn't um, fails after a while, um, and that's happened in in two pairs now. So one pair I took it back, they fixed it, and the second pair I've yet to take them back. So that's the only problem I'm aware of, is that. But at the moment, the rest seem to be doing pretty well. And this meeting. Really, if Graham and I go bird watching together, we both need a pair, don't we? Yeah, there's lots of fights. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of these. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come over. <laughs> yeah. I don't need them. Uh, the first time I went out with my wife on a, a date, we were out, headed out into the bush to do some uh, yeah. bird watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and. Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> And I loaned her my binos, she's looking at bird, and we jumped back in the car and took off down the bush track and I braked for the creek and the binos went straight off the top of the roof and bounced down. Oh, no. And, uh, you ran over? No, into the water. <laughs> but all was good. They survived. Um, so they're, they're pretty reasonable. But uh, in the past, you, with the, the way the old prisms were set up, the offset ones, they used to move when you dropped them. These I think are a bit more stable nowadays. They, I, I've not had that problem at all. Yeah. Okay. Shall we get going then? Um, I was this week wanting to talk about um, behaviours of birds Everyone can see that. Behaviours of birds that, that help us to identify them. So getting to the point where you don't actually have to see the purple gape, if you know what I mean. Mm. You, you can actually, by where the bird is and what it's doing and the way it's moving around even, you can actually get a fair idea of what it must be. And, and then you might just have to look for one thing to confirm that. So taking it beyond the, the point of having to look at that perfect profile every time just to, to see all the different colours and, and finally confirm what it is, to start you on the path of the next step where, where a, a person, they, they talk about the, the jizz of the bird. They used to talk about the jizz of aircraft in the Second World War. It wasn't just about seeing it in perfect profile. It was about how it was flying, where it was flying, what it was capable of doing. So, you know, if, it, if you see a galah at a long distance, suddenly they'll drop sideways and they do that side flip and they'll drop height really quickly. And not many birds do that. And, and so you can guess that it's probably something like a galah. Um, and, and, and the one I use, the classic example is if your mother crosses the road a kilometre down the road, you know it's your mum. It, 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 it's the way they walk. It's the fact that they're walking at that time of the day. It's the way they hold their head. It's that little bit of a, a funny walk that they do. Whatever it is that you know, and you know that in detail, that, that sort of understanding of a bird is the, the next step where you really want to go to. So that no matter what, even if it's a really dark evening and the sun's behind it, you can actually identify it. So to do that, we're going to talk about how they feed, what they feed on, how they drink, how they maintain the feathers, preen themselves, um, migrating birds, when they appear and when they disappear, whether they are birds that live there all their life in the one space, 
They've got, they've got their home range and that's just where they live and they defend that at certain times of the year and other times of the year they don't. Um, how they communicate, how they hang around with each other. Things like when you see a group of, of crows or ravens, you know it's not an Australian raven. can't be. They just hang around in pairs. So things like that. Resting and roosting, where they go and how they gather together and then the, the different breeding setups that they have. And it, it's not all encompassing because that's impossible but it's to get you to start to recognise these cues and think about them a bit more. So to start with, yeah, modern cameras are amazing. Thinking about how they feed and there's, there's many different types of feeding behaviours that the birds have but one group, and tonight, you know, I, I, when I was saying it's a honey eater, I knew it was a honey eater. It couldn't have been anything else. And that was just because of the shape of the head and the bill. Okay? And then we finally got to see it a bit better, and it's a purple gate honey eater. But it wasn't another group of birds. There's no way it was, it was a honey eater. So in the same way, learning to recognise that bill and recognise where they feed and how they feed is, is really important. To start with, these birds are adapted to feeding on nectar. And in order to do that, they have special tongues. So with a lot of your honey eaters, they have long, wispy, straw-like tongues with lots of bits to them. And, and they act like little capillary tubes that wick the, the, the liquids out of the flower. So they can plonk that tongue into the flower, the liquids run up the various threads of the tongue and back into the mouth. So they, can bear, they don't have to suck it out, the, the tongue just does it for them. Like a brush. Like a brush, like when you, you put a, a thin tube into water and the water runs up the tube because it's attracted to the sides and, and so it, it's drawn up the tube. Yeah. And if you follow the tongue back, it comes to a, a bit more of a solid bit and then you usually have some funny little bits out to the side and, and so it goes back into the mouth. That's right back here. So they're adapted to feeding on the nectar and they're adapted in the way that quickly draws the nectar out of the flowers. These guys, they also feed on the nectar and their tongue, it's a little bit different. It's sort of like two funny brushes but again, it's lots of long thin bits that wick the nectar out of the flower up onto the tongue. Yeah, so you can see that there? Now, so it, it's sort of a bit like that. And, and they put that brush or set of brushes into the flower to draw the nectar out. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, funny sort of tongue. There's the major part of the tongue and then there's the bits on the end that allow it to collect the nectar. Okay, so honey eaters and lorikeets very much adapted to that style of feeding. At the same time, they can also use that beak to catch insects and so you see them hawking like we were watching tonight, flying off and coming back. Okay. Then... They do. Um, and they'll, they'll use their, their bill rather than their tongue in, in that case to, to crunch things up. But... Yeah, their, their tongue is specifically adapted for, for the nectar. And so you get your, your eucalypts flowering and in they come and yeah, just the whole tree will be full of them. The next thing I'd like to talk about, there's a whole suite of insects that, uh, sorry, of birds that feed on insects. And they're adapted in all sorts of ways and their behaviours are specifically about collecting insects in particular types of microhabitats. So it, it, it might be taking things off leaves, it might be taking things off bark, it might be collecting things off ground. So 
So we'll go through and talk about some of them. And the first one, the ones that I really like, are Satellas versus the tree creepers. We get the Satellas down here. We don't get the tree creepers, unfortunately. As you go up to the top of their peninsula, you, you get, there's only one species over here and it's easy to identify. It's very obvious colouring. But if you go into Victoria and New South Wales and out into the eastern side of South Australia, you'll see quite a few other tree creepers that do the same sort of thing. Typically, when you see them feeding on the trunks, you'll see them fly from the top of a tree to the bottom. And then they'll work their way up the trunk, right out to the outer canopy, and then down to the bottom of the next tree and work their way up again. Oh, and then one out of work, the tree creepers. That's what intrigued me. Now I know what I'm looking at, what, how it's identified. Yep. For that reason, what you just saying, how it's there. Yep. Down the tree and going up the branches and picking pieces of bark over on, on the gum. Yeah. On insects. Yeah. And the Satellas, there, there's a lot of them around here, actually quite neat, but they do the opposite. They actually start at the top of the tree and work their way down the trunk. And it's almost like they defy gravity. That That's not an upside down photo, that's just the way they, they work. They, they work their way down the trunks. And so they can pass the tree creepers on the way up and they're both feeding on totally different microhabitats. Because if I'm working my way down, I'm looking into the cracks as I'm going down. And if a tree creeper is going up, it's looking into the cracks as it goes up. Totally different niches, feeding on different things. Well, they might be the same things, just one tucked un under the bottom and one tucked under the top. And the way they fly is different. These guys, you usually get a group, five, ten of them, and they'll flutter across in a, a, a loose flock, quite close together but loose, and into the top of the tree and you'll hear them calling and work down the tree and then off they go again. These guys, often ones or twos or threes, by themselves, and there you'll see them flying separately from tree to tree, but nearby each other, but quite, quite different behaviours. So thinking about that, quite easy to identify from a, a fair way away because you're seeing just the silhouette of the bird doing what it's doing. A lot of the insect eaters collect stuff off leaves and, and so it's a different type of gleaning. Gleaning is where you're perched and you're taking the prey from directly in, around you, in front of you. So you might be gleaning off bark or you might be gleaning off leaves uh, and so on. The partilotes, remember we had them last week? We had the striated partilotes, the, the double call. Mm -hmm. Do you remember them? And they were working through the trees around us as we walked up towards the dam. Mm -hmm. Yep. They are typically feeding on these things. They're little sugar caps. They're called lerps. And they're made by this little insect called a psyllid. And the psyllid you can see is on the vein of the leaf. It's got a sharp little proboscis that sticks down into the, the, the part of the vein. You've got the xylem and the phloem. The xylem carry the water and, and the phloem carry the sugars and that sort of thing. And they're feeding out of the phloem. But in, those, in the liquid inside the veins, there's lots of sugars. There's more than they ever want. So actually, a lot of it goes straight through their digestive tract and they excrete it out the other end. And they use it to make this covering. And they hide under it. And the covering is called a lerp. Uh, that's magnified, but actual size, they get up to about five or six mil across. They used to be much more common than they are today, and Aboriginals would be able to go out and in 15, 20, 30 minutes on their peninsula, they could collect a big bundle like that. Basically, go and buy a kilogram of sugar. <laughs> okay, and we, we don't see it as much anymore, but if you had lots of lerps lying on the ground, usually that was a good sign that mallee fowl were breeding. 
they would that would be a sign that the conditions were really good and the Mallee fowler would be out feeding on them as well. Um, but you, you'll see them on lots of eucalypts. If you have a look around, you, you'll start to notice them. And these little guys are coming along and they're just using the side of their bill just to take the uh, lurp off the leaf. And they might be taking the psyllid as well. In some areas you get birds that don't take the psyllid and they just take the lurp. And bell miners in Victoria, for example, around Melbourne, you get lots of bell miners. They have a really distinctive call. And the, they lead to the trees getting really unhealthy because they just take the lurp and they chase away other birds that might take the psyllids. So you actually get trees loaded up with all these psyllids and, and lots of lurps on them and they get quite unhealthy. And that's because of the way they feed and the fact that they're aggressive towards other birds. Take them away. Possibly. Um, the next type of feeding is what's called snatching, where the birds are actively dropping onto a surface and grabbing the prey as they see them. And in in spring, in particular, when when these uh, red wattle birds are, are trying to feed their young, they're tra trying to chase a lot of protein, and so they're after insects and spiders and You'll see them come in and check out the eaves of your house and the particular behaviours they do. But one of the ones you often see, and it's quite distinctive because they're not strong and graceful like the tree creepers and, and able, able to just move up the branch with ease. They'll come in and they sort of flap around and climb up the tree and yeah, chasing all sorts of things hidden in nooks and crannies. The wee bill we heard last week, the wee bill, we got a good look at that. One of the neat little behaviours they have, they're, they're ones that are feeding on the, the lerps and psyllids and other insects on the leaf. But every now and then they'll just pop out of the canopy that they're feeding in and you'll see them hovering in a very distinctive way right in front of the leaves and they'll just grab something out of it. And you can sort of see that behaviour from quite a way away and you, you sort of know immediately what it probably is. There's a few other birds that do it. Um, thornbills, some of them have the same behaviour, but yeah, quite quite distinctive. And and this guy, where did I put my iPad? Here we go. Uh, do you know what that fellow is? A no, it's like a wagtail. Oh, no. 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 You get them around here. They have a really, it's like a, a, a strong grating scissory noise. Have you come across them? It's sort of fly catching. Yeah, yeah, scissor grind. Yeah, you get them down here. They're not very common down here, but as you go north you get, yep, yeah, and, and particularly on the east, uh, west coast you get a lot of them down through there. Um, so let me just... So, yep, yeah, restless flycatcher. They have a distinctive call, but then they have this call. And this one. And then, let me get the scissor grinder one. And you'll hear those calls, they'll be working through the canopy or something like that. But this one in particular, you often hear it and they'll, they'll be hovering just above the ground, about yay high, quite distinctive sort of hover. And, and they'll be making that call. And the idea seems to be that they scare insects somehow with the calls that they're using. And, and they'll see it move and they'll drop down and grab it and then fly on again. But that, that particular behaviour where they're hovering really distinctively just above the ground, you, you can see it a mile away and you know what it is. Okay, So the, the restless flycatcher, um, it's on our peninsula. It does look a bit like willy wagtail, except the willy wagtail has black much further down onto the chest and there's always the eyebrow. 
these guys don't have the eyebrow. But the willy wagtail, when it sits up, it, it sits up sort of very bold and, and straight, whereas these guys, they have a much different profile, longer and thinner, quite, quite distinctive. Um, anyway, the behaviours, the way they feed, becomes quite distinctive sometimes. Another type of, of feeding is what's called hawking. And we saw some of that tonight with the purple gates honey eater. And that's where they sit on a perch and you see them, they'll be looking around and they'll fly up and chase something, grab it, and then back to the perch again. And that's called hawking. And quite a few of the birds, tawny crowned honey eater, um, rainbow beater is one that you see doing that all the time. And this guy's the king of it all, grey fan tail. But there's lots of different birds that do it and it, it's a key source of food and, and hawking. So we've had gleaning, snatching and hawking. What's that bird that can get to you immediately? There's some that I'm, I'm letting you work out when we get to... <laughs> These guys, pouncing, where you'll see them sitting and they'll be looking at the ground and down they go and grab something and back up again. And these in particular, this is the eastern yellow robin. We don't get them here, but over in Adelaide and that you do. And you, you go into a thicker bit of forest, woodlandy area, and you'll see them plonked up on the side of a, a tree and they sort of have this really definite behaviour there. It's very obvious from a long way away you can pick it. And our western yellow robins, which doesn't have the yellow coming up as far and much whiter through here, they, they do the same, but not, not nearly as distinctive as these guys do. Um, scarlet robins, same sort of thing. David Payton talks a lot about why robins might be disappearing out of the Adelaide region. And, and he talks about how the branches, the sideways branches that used to come off trees that were well spaced, you don't see them anymore. So we cut out the trees and we plant in ours and we put them in nice long lines and they're all close together and so the tree grows straight up and, and you don't get that nice big lateral branch that is quite so common. And, and the birds that rely on that don't have the habitat as much. And do you know these guys? Tawny frogmouth. They're doing that in the evenings. So if you ever get one outside your house with the light on outside... You, you'll see it sitting on the branch and then it'll be dropping down and grabbing moss and insects and that on the ground, for example. So that sort of pouncing behaviour can help you with different birds. Uh, and then you get birds that actually glean off the ground. And I'm sure you'll recognise some of these. As you head up north, you'll get this guy. Yeah. White brow babblers, they're a bit more common down south. This guy's up north. Very distinctive call. But they're actually working along the ground all the time. And a lot of our ground feeding birds, they're the ones that are becoming quite rare. And that seems to be about loss of complexity in the understory. So you're not getting as much growth as we used to in that understory in the woodlandy areas. And so they seem to be disappearing out of a lot of parts of the world. <laughs> These guys, they're pursuing insects in the air. And that's it. That's For many of them, that's what they do 24-7. They're flying around. So you've got swifts and swallows, and wood swallows, you know the one up the top? Very distinctive call. You hear it out in the bushland over here. Have you heard this call before? Yeah? Yeah, out through the forested areas. It's one of those. It's a nightjar, and you and you have that little spot, spotted nightjar. So these birds, 
are catching insects in the air. And I put this one in because that really broad bill, that they're a short little bill, but when they open their mouth, you get this big, nice, round, circular mouth that, that's good for catching insects. And, you know, they'll be flying all day. These ones, you might just hear them, barely see them with binoculars high up in the sky and they're just flying around, feeding in, in the air. Um, these guys you're quite familiar with. We don't seem to see these as much anymore, but they, particularly down in Flurio Peninsula and south down there, you get them coming through with storm fronts and they fly around Australia and they might spend three, four, five months here. Most of them don't even land, they just fly 24-7. So quite interesting and the adaptations of their bills, again, it's about the way they feed. Um, Kingfisher, I'm sure you're all familiar with their style of feeding. They sit up and they're watching and down like a, like a um, kookaburra, same sort of thing. Then there's the granivores, which are feeding on the seeds right through the habitat. And they have some really distinctive characteristics. Granivores have to drink every day. So if you want to see your granivores, you go and sit beside some watering point and they'll fly into you each evening. And, and that's something that's good fun to do out in the desert. And some of them will fly a long way, 80, 90, 100 kilometres just to get to the water in the evenings and then back out to feed and roost. So granivores have very distinctive behaviours because of the food they eat and the way in which they have to digest and break it down. The, the big bill of the, the generalist ground feeder, you're all familiar with those sorts of bills, that big strong bill, will eat a wide variety of foods. Then we start to move on to the way in which they, they drink. Um, a lot of birds don't have powerful enough peristalsis. Do you know what I mean by peristalsis? So when we swallow, our food in, in a, a bolus gets driven down into our stomach and we can actually swallow upside down because the muscles behind the food contract and the muscles in front of the food relax and so you get this wave that drives the food towards the stomach. And we can do that with water as well. But a lot of birds don't have powerful enough peristalsis to actually be able to put their mouth in the water and drink. Yeah, so they put it in, they fill it up with water and then they let it run down their throat. So the way in which they drink can be quite distinctive. Others can. And then you've got things like the swallows and the martins which just come in on the dam in the evening and you see them having a, a little drink as they go across the surface and then back up and off. Bat, bats do that. That's one way we catch bats just string a little bit of fishing line across a dam in the evening and when they come in to drink they'll hit the fishing line, fall into the water and have to swim to the edge and you just go over and pick them up out of the water. <laughs> so that, that sort of drinking, that's your, your classic um, bird that really can stay in the air 24-7 if they need to. These guys don't but they, the, the things like the swifts, they can. They have half the brain that sleeps and the other half is awake and then they swap around. The flock bronze wings are a good one because they do fly in the desert huge distances to get to water and then they'll even walk into the water and they feel their, the feathers, the downy feathers, special ones on their breast with water and they'll fly back to their young and the young can drink from the, the water that they carry back for them. So, some, some distinctive behaviours. Um, the way in which birds communicate can be also quite distinctive. Just a few extreme examples. Uh, where we have magpies, Australia is pretty much split up into territories for birds, for magpies. And then there's areas that are not so much fought over and that's where you get lots of young ones that gather. But where the birds have their territories, if another bird comes in and you've 
all seen this, I'm sure. Mm. They mob it and, and you get that highly aggressive interaction. You, you can hear that sort of um, yelling at each other, if you like, from a long way away. It's a very distinctive behaviour. Uh, these guys, when they get together, they call that a corroboree, which I think is a lovely way of describing it. Mm. And that corroboree of New Holland honey eaters, you know that, that call that they have when they're all together. You don't have to be there to see it. You just mm -hmm. know that. So that's when they have more sprinkler. Yeah. Yeah. On those hot summer days, you turn on your sprinkler and suddenly you've got 30 or 40 of these guys. Mm -hmm. And they're doing particularly well at the moment across most of our mm. urban areas. Those still hang on that garden without the trees. Yeah. Those they're so still. The that come right up and yeah. So there's things there that they're benefiting from. Mm. This guy, when he gives that karacha sort of call off in the distance, you can see that a mile off, the way they hold themselves up and, mm. and burst forth with that call. That posture is very distinctive. You don't need to be too close to pick him out. Something like a reed warbler, very distinctive call and it's coming from a particular type of habitat, the reeds along a river or around a, a wetland. And you don't often see them, but it's a very obvious call from a very obvious habitat. And there's not much else it could be. So learning the call in the habitat helps. Um, then there's the way in which they hang around together. And I'm sure you've all seen this. I was talking this evening about crows and ravens. We have the two ravens, the little raven, the Australian raven on our peninsula, and they tend to be on, well, all across our peninsula. And the most common one around here is typically the little raven. And it doesn't quite have the death rattle of the Australian raven. If you see a raven calling and flicking its wings as it calls, it's a little raven. And then the straight... Yeah, what, what sort of a raven would it be, or it might even be a crow, at the Trinity Lake? Uh, Don't know. We'll talk yeah, about big. we'll talk about the, the how you can tell them apart, but yeah, okay. I, I, I be one of those. Yeah, one of those three. It's just big and even. Right? And this this call from the Australian raven is quite distinctive. Australian raven, you'll just get them hanging around in pairs all year together. They stay in the one territory. That, that's their place. Every now and then you might get a group of eight or ten young Australian ravens together, but very loose group. But when you get these bigger flocks, probably little crow or little raven. And guys like this, you know, do you know what they are? Yeah. Little finches. Sort of what, what sort of? Zebra finch. Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. Very distinctive call. And you get them in big groups, big flocks moving through up a, a, a creek line out in the drier country. You'll often see them moving together. And you get quite big groups of them. Yeah, they cover a tree. Yeah. I've seen it like Christmas trees. Yeah. It's covered in birds. There's, a, there's another one that's more extreme in Africa uh, called a quelia. And, and quelias, I, I've been on the Zambezi and watched a flock of quelias, probably about as wide as this room. They fly about 60, 70 kilometres an hour, pretty quick. And I've stood there and watched a flock fly past me for an, over an hour. You can't begin to imagine how many birds were in this flock, and it's it, it's like a ribbon flying through the air, and as far as you can see in each direction, it's just this flock of quelia, all flying about this far apart. They actually do a lot of research on them because their ability to fly so close in such a big group is quite amazing, and they will literally break branches off trees, so they'll land in trees, and there's so many of them. All these little birds stacked into a tree, they actually will break branches off. So, quite intriguing. But the flocking behaviours, if, you, if you're seeing cockatiels uh, flying together, you get those beautiful white as they all bank together and really fast flying. Quite distinctive behaviours. So, the way they hang around together can be useful. And this I love, how they roost. So, have you ever seen... a a group of starlings land on a telephone wire or electrical wire or something like that mm. or on a, an aerial and you'll see they're all perfectly spaced. 
they're exactly one pecking distance apart. <laughs> and if someone lands in the wrong place and two birds can turn around and peck it, that is so often seen it's not funny. Okay, it's pecked, it's up, fly down, drops off, flies around, comes around, finds a space that's big enough. Yeah. But there was sort of a gap between these three groups of them. Yeah. And as one would come and fly in and sit on this second group, they would jump, 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 jump down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Jump, 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 jump. And and if they're not if they're not that perfect distance apart, it's yeah. it's all hell breaks loose. Yeah. So, <laughs> gotta, 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 gotta. so those sort of behaviours they're very distinctive and it's quite fun. Whereas something like these guys, the way they clump up together at night, they love to huddle next to each other and and very distinctive. Um, through to, um, this is on the 80 mile beach near Broome, shall I have Broome? And, and you look along the beach and it looks like there's seaweed all along the beach and then you actually get up there and it's actually hundreds of thousands of, of shorebirds all stacked along the beach. And they, they gather together at high tide and, and shorebirds, if you think in, in this area at 80 Mile Beach, the, the mud flats they feed on, there's an 8 or 9 or 10 metre tide in that part of the world. So you've got 5 kilometres of mud flats that they're feeding on and they're spread out across that and it's really good food and there's lots of them. And then the high tide comes in and you've got 5 kilometres of birds all concertinaed up into <laughs> the beach. And that's what you get. As you drive along this 80 Mile Beach, you drive past hundreds of thousands of birds and um, I got the opportunity to go up there, WA government employed a few people to go up and do surveys there. Um, so I got to go there last year and do that and it's quite intriguing to drive along. That's, that's probably got 10, 15 species in it and you've got to count them. And so you're counting in tens and hundreds and thousands and then you're driving along and, and suddenly a group you've counted will fly past you in the direction you're counting. So you've got to subtract them as they go past. And then another group will fly that way and you've got to add them to what you've just counted. And yeah, it's, it's a... Uh, I, I know my shorebirds pretty well, but this really does stretch you to a new dimension. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating world. Um, and then you get guys like this where you've got birds that come out and feed at night, night heron, and, and they'll just roost by themselves in trees all day. So when they're roosting and, and how they're roosting. And then birds that feed at night and they spend all day camouflaged on the ground. I don't know if you've ever seen, I, I've seen one or two and they're just beautifully camouflaged and you can come up quite close and they're just sitting there perfectly still pretending not to be there. So we, we looked at uh, night jars before, one flying. So they're night jars, that's an owl at night jar. And you see them, um, they love hollows, particularly in the Mallee country and you can come up and scratch the tree trunk with a, a branch and it's like a goanna coming up and I'll just burst out. So that's the way you can survey for them. And then you'll fly you'll see them fly and they'll fly in a straight direction. They know all the hollows in their area and they'll just go plonk straight down the hollow. And you can go over and scratch that one and they'll fly out and plonk straight down the next hollow. And they yeah. Um, but where they're roosting and how they're roosting can be pretty key. And then some of the behaviours, you know, we all can pick a magpie chasing a hawk. They fly up in that very distinctive way and harass it for a while and then off. And these guys, we're starting to get quite a few of them now in, in the lower EP parks um, where, where there's really good fox control going on. Have you seen the bushstone curlews? Or um, bush pygmies? They have a very distinctive call. Um, if you go out to, what is it, September Beach, that part of the world out, Donington Cottage, Donington Peninsula, you'll hear them call all night, it's beautiful. 
Bushstone curve here you go. It's quite haunting if you don't know what it is. Um, it's a call when I lived in Darwin. It, it's a call all around Darwin. It's quite common. But yeah, you get them down at, at, in the Donington uh, cottage area. It's really quite common. Lovely, and they will call all evening. Then there's social systems, the birds that hang around together. Um, noisy miners particularly good at this. They have, we've created their perfect habitat for them. Um, woodlands with a grassy understory, that's just what they love. And they get into huge flocks. And in New South Wales they've become a real problem. You get flocks, one, two, three thousand birds. And when they one gives an alarm call, the others all give an alarm call and they all come in together and they'll attack whatever it is that the alarm call is based on. Yeah, they, they do, they're not quite the same but they, they will group, yeah, yes, and we, we've created their habitat again that they really like. Yeah, <laughs> um, and these are spread right across, right through Victoria right into South Australia and where you have them they lead to the loss of a lot of small birds. So if you've got um, particularly habitat fragments of five hectares or less and the noisy miners move in you'll lose all sorts of species straight away. And you take the noisy miners out and within half an hour the number of species will climb up 10, 15 or more because the little birds can come back in. And one of the things you can do to help against the noisy miners, if you've got trees and grass, is put an understory back in. Lots of close bushes, thick close bushes on the ground together. And so the little birds have a place to retreat to that they can get away from the attacks of the miners. Whereas here you've got a dove and it's copping it. And, and they will kill lots of small birds with the aggressive attacks that you get. I'm sure you're all familiar with chuffs. Yeah. Lovely bird. Um, predator distraction to display. So if you're down along the beach and you see a hooded plover walking along in front of you and he walks along in front of you and he walks along <laughs> in front of you and they just keep going, he's not there because he's just wanting to walk along in front of you. If he wanted to, he'd walk back around. You've just walked past his nest and he's taking you off. If he's walking along in front of you and he's doing a broken wing display, You've just walked past some young ones and hopefully you didn't step on them. But they, they're little things and they just crouch down in the weed and, and disappear. And, and then the adult uses that visual display to drag you away from them. So the ways in which birds gather together and, and how they do particular behaviours can be quite distinctive. The next one, in our part of the world we see a lot of these. They're out in the open fields, gr grasslands, in the cropped areas and you'll hear them calling up high and then you'll see them do this funny fluttering flight with wings high and legs drooped and they'll drop down towards the ground calling as they go and I'm sure you've heard this call. Uh, no, the, the skylark is the introduced one and we have them. This is the brown song lark. So here's the... Yeah, so this is a native one. They're quite fascinating because the males are about twice the size of the females. The males are the ones you see doing this flight and the call. The females are much smaller and on the ground typically. Song lark. Brown song lark. So they're a native one, whereas the skylarks have been introduced and they're... Yeah, and, and, uh, and uh, you see that the wings high and they have this really distinctive flapping of the wings like that. Only in the open country. Yeah, only in the open country. And the legs dangling down beneath them, a sort of funny sort of helicopter sort of behaviour. And they, they will be calling up high and then you'll see them drop. The song larks, they have a behaviour that's similar in that they call high 
and you'll see them drop, but they don't drop in the same way. They don't have that really distinctive flight as they're dropping. So a, a song lark... Um, uh, Eurasian skylark, they call them now. That, that's an introduced one that's spread um, right across southern... That, that's a skylark? Or... Eurasian skylark is they've had various names over the years, but Eurasian skylark, and and they're pretty common right through the area as well. But this one, quite different way in which it sings and and drops. No, that's different again. So that one, and then we get these guys. You tend to get them in treed areas particularly along the creeks as you go further north. And they're a, a song lark as well, but they have a little bit different song. Let me just play it for you. And they'll fly around, but they won't do this dropping and helicoptering from on high. They'll fly around in sort of big rectangles, might be 100 metres by 50 metres sort of rectangles. Or, or squares or whatever. And then you'll see them land for a while and call and then they'll fly around calling again. And, and there, the, the roof is song lark. So they're sort of similar, closely related. They have slightly different calls and they have slightly different behaviours as they're defending their territory. Now, any the roof is you, you, they do come down. They're, they're more common as you go north. But we have a lot more of the brown song larks down here. Um, something like spotted partalote, the, the striated partalote that we saw last week, they tend to nest in hollows in trees, as will the spotted a bit. But the spotted, particularly, you, you'll have a, a, a classic example will be there a track with a little bit of a, a, a bank on the side of the track with sand. And, and you'll see a bird fly down, they'll just poof straight into the side of the bank. And they'll have a little hole with tunnel that they've dug and they'll have the nest at the end of the tunnel. If you go over and look, it, it, it's usually quite classic. There'll be a little hole and, and then you'll see the two skid marks where the feet hit as they come <laughs> flying and, they just, and, and the bird just disappears into the hole at full speed. Quite spectacular. And then uh, out and burst off. Um, something like a rainbow bee eater. They tend to, you'll just have flat ground which is sandy and you'll see this colour come out of the sand and they'll have a metre or two metre long hole that they've dug into the sand that they'll be nesting in. Wow. So they're, they're worth trying to track down. And of course, kingfishers, particularly in Lincoln National Park, you see lots of them there. They love where you've got the calcrete around the coast and beneath the calcrete you usually get quite a chalky layer and they'll have a hole where they're nesting in that. So, and right around the region. Um, Jackie Winters. They've got the most beautiful nest and the ones of, only ones I've ever seen all look like this. You've got a branch coming up off the ground and then there's a fork in the branch and right in the fork is their nest. Beautiful nest made out of spider webs and bits of bark and lichen. And then Jackie Winter will be sitting up. You'll see them fly up onto it and just sort of disappear and then off again. But very distinctive, lovely call, quite a common bird on EP, particularly as you go north. Things like cook. Did you just say call? Yep. No. No, and it's one of those birds that bit tricky to identify because it's pretty plain. But this call, um, if you don't hear it when you go out in nice bushland, I'd be very surprised. Particularly where you've got, um, you know, our uh, sugar gums, blue gums, that sort of country. Uh, if you happen to be up at Wood, uh, Woodner and head out to Pogary Rock or Polder Dam or something, lots of these around. And they, they're called Jackie Winter because they start calling really early during winter. And so you, you, you actually, 
Um, over the next few months, you'll start to hear them call a lot. It's quite fun. Then things like this where you get suddenly you'll be looking at this really big bird making pathetic begging noises and there'll be a whole lot of other little things like blue wrens or whatever flying around it, coming up and feeding it and suddenly you click. It's a cuckoo and I'll talk a lot more about cuckoos over the next few weeks but um, it's quite amazing that you get these monstrous great cuckoos that are left as an egg in the nest. They're brought up by typically small wrens and fed until adulthood. They then migrate, most of them, head up north, come back and then start cuckooing. They find another cuckoo okay. partner. <laughs> they lay their eggs in these little birds' nests and so the cycle goes around. But all those behaviours, they can't be learned because they never see their parents. They're fed by another species. It's quite intriguing. So they're things that are genetically passed on. And yeah, make you start to wonder about what's going on. Okay, so look, it, it, that's a real whirlwind run through a whole suite of things that you can start to think about when you're trying to learn about the bird. It's not just about the colour and what the colour is and where it is on the bird. That's, that's bird identification 101. The next level up is to take all these different things that we can see and use them to identify the bird as well. And you might have to look to see one particular patterning or colour to get the final identification if they're closely related species. But on the whole, a whole bunch of them, you don't need to do that because you'll know characteristics of the bird as you get to know them better. <coughs> okay. Um, one last thing I'd like to quickly talk about, because we're going to start using these words a little bit, is the way in which a bird molts and the, the different molts that we get as they go through their life. And just starting with the, the, the type of plumage that you see, so you'll get young ones with the downy cover we talked about last week and the week before. And then they'll molt and they do a molt called a prejuvenile molt. And that's when they're getting the feathers that will cover them after they've left the nest in many cases. Or in some cases they, they won't have that downy stage. They're, they're precocial chicks and they just take off like a mallee fowl. They're, they're ready to go. So you, you get them in this juvenile plumage. And then at some stage, they'll molt again into using what's called a pre-basic molt. They'll slowly replace all the feathers on their body and you'll have them move into their first adult plumage, a basic plumage. And there's lots of different words for that basic plumage, but it, it's best to use this, this description. And that's usually a full molt of the whole body. All the feathers, all the flight feathers, tail feathers and everything else. And then some birds will have an alternate plumage and that's typically a molt that they'll do coming into breeding season. Not always. And that alternative plumage, it, it might be, you know, your blue wren that you see and you get the males at one time of the year they're quite drab and they're, in the, they're back in their basic plumage and then they'll molt into that really bright colouring in late winter, spring or late winter, in winter. And that's their alternative plumage. And that's the pre-alternate molt. And that's usually not the main feathers in the wings or the tails. They're, they're energetically very expensive to produce them. It's the, the body plumage. So over the body. So it's usually a partial molt. Not always, but it usually is. Birds have the challenge of, you know, some birds, they'll be pushing through bush all the day, every day, and so their feathers wear out and they need to molt a bit more. Others are out in the UV sun, into the ocean, they're wearing their feathers out in other ways. And so the frequency of molting can vary a lot. But typically you have a basic molt 
every year and then some species do an alternate molt midway through the year. So they can be complete every feather on the body or they can be partial, usually just the body feathers, not the, not the flight feathers. Basic plumage, there's other words for it. People talk about winter plumage or non-breeding plumage. But sometimes the basic plumage, they'll have it all year and so it's their breeding plumage and their non-breeding plumage. So it doesn't make sense to use that term when they talk about basic plumage. And alternate plumage. Um, other people refer to it sometimes in literature as breeding plumage or nuptial plumage. There's different names for it. But these are probably the best terms to use because they're actually quite meaningful. Now, there's four different main ways that birds molt and it, it, it can be quite complex when you start to look at that in detail. Um, and I, I won't do that to you now, but there's whole books on it. Okay, So the way in which they molt and, and what they do can be broken down quite simply to these main stages. And when we say a pre-juvenile molt, that means it's before they get their juvenile plumage. So they're molting to produce their juvenile plumage. Does that make sense? So a pre-juvenile molt to give you the juvenile plumage. And then you get a pre-basic molt to give you the basic plumage. And then sometimes you'll get a pre-alternate molt to give you the alternate plumage. That's and breeding purposes, isn't it? Yeah. And then at the end of the breeding period they might have a pre-basic molt which is all the feathers and you'll go back to the basic plumage. So not all birds do that alternate plumage? No. Not and not all birds just... Some, some have an additional molt between juvenile and adult on basic and, and yeah, there's a few complexities there that I won't talk about. But for the moment you need to have a knowledge of juvenile, basic and alternate. Just be aware of what I'm meaning. And the molts are called pre-juvenile, pre-basic and pre-alternate. So this new book you said from the CSIRO, that one's going to have that, stages of... Yeah, th there's a lot of stages in these books, but there's a lot of gaps. I'll, I'll, as we go through these 10 weeks, I'll put up birds that are not in the book. Okay? And that doesn't mean they don't exist. It's just that they haven't been described. That particular juvenile plumage or, or whatever hasn't been drawn up. I noticed there is a bit of a difference between the app and the book yep. as well. And the, you, you'll see very big differences between books. Mm. Yeah. There's a whole suite of challenges and I think what they're aiming to do with this new book is cover off on more of that than what's been done in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay, so be aware of that. And then um, BirdLife Australia produce a, a journal twice a year called Wingspan, which is a really good, useful journal. And one of the things they do quite regularly is have an article on tricky to identify birds. And, and these are the sheets I've given you. Um, and the thing about fairy wrens is most people, if they can't see the male, can't identify the fairy wren because they're the only obvious plumages that they know. And the problem is that those males don't have that plumage for six months of the year. So if you can't identify the females of each of these species, you actually can't identify the species for at least six months of the year, which is not good. Or even worse, the males are typically very secretive. They're very bright and colourful and you, you know, they, they hide away in the back of the bush. If you can do your little whistling call or whatever, you know, something like that, or a cork on a bottle was the old way of doing it, the, the females typically will come up to you and you'll get a good look at the females. And you can identify all of them from the plumage. And it's about looking at the beak, the little bit between the beak and the eye. Can you remember what name that has? 
<laughs> You've got your sheets there? A little bit between the beak and the eye. The law. Good. Well done. And then the ring around the eye. And if you can look at those three characteristics and the tail, you can pretty much identify them. The females tend to have brown bills. The males in their basic plumage tend to have black bills. So if you're looking at a black bill, you're thinking, oh, that's a male in a basic plumage, and you can identify most of them as well. Now, unfortunately, the picture I've given you is that low-quality one. This, this is high-quality, so that's all good, but I've printed off a low-quality one. I'll, I'll do another one of these as a high-quality version and get them to you next week. But you can look at each of these, and there's two things in your advantage. On most places in Australia, there's probably only three, four, and maybe even five fairy wrens max in a local area. So, um, Munyaru over south of Wyala, um, I've had uh, splendid, superb, and white winged, and um, variegated, and blue breasted fairy wrens. But that's one of the few places where you'll get five species. Um, yep, so we're going to spend tonight looking a little bit at how to tease the males and females apart and how to tease the females apart from each other. Okay, but um, one of the things you need to start doing is looking for the females and you can start to identify them. It, it's easily done. So uh, we don't need to see those big, bright, colourful males to identify the fairy wren. That's the key point of that. So have a read of that when you get a chance. Fifty Shades of Brown. All good. Now, we'll stop there. Grab a cuppa and have a snack if you want. And then we'll get started in 